Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you here today. I pray that you are having a wonderful Mother's Day. Listen, it is, that is today, Mother's Day. So I, listen, I'll, first thing I want to do is welcome all our moms here today. I'm glad you are here. I know many of you are here with your mom, and that's a blessing. Great uh, that you were able to do that, just coming to spend a little time with, with mom and worshiping with us. So thank you for coming and being here today. And uh, looking forward to a great day of worship, and I promise you we're going to try to get you out of here uh, where you can go spend a little more time with mom after church. But uh, listen, for right now, we're here to worship God. I do want to read a, a scripture as I was reading this week. I just love, uh, I love this, and we're talking about moms and, and that type of thing, and you can't help but look at the wisdom of Proverbs. And Proverbs says this, it says, But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised and that's what we want to do some of us listen some of you have had a, a godly mother who has uh just really shown you what it is to love the lord and, and to re, and to have a reverence for the lord and so man <clears throat> that kind of mom is a mom to be praised in verse 31 of proverbs 31 says give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates Man, our moms do so much for us, and it's just great to have a day where we get to celebrate them and honor them, and we're going to do that today as well. But uh, thank you for being here, and I'm going to let Miss Melanie come and lead us in a song of worship. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, when I was thinking and praying about what songs to do for Mother's Day, Count Your Blessings came to mind. We usually do it around Thanksgiving time, but... What a blessing our mothers are. Let's all stand and sing Count Your Blessings.
may be seated. Let's sing, How Great Thou Art.
to share a few announcements with you. Don't forget, Wednesdays, we have our series through the book of Daniel. We'll be continuing that this week. So I want to encourage you to come and be here for that. Then as well, I uh, also want to mention that today starts the uh, beginning of the collection of, of the whole Skylark baby bottles. Uh, listen, will you see the bottles out on the table out in the lobby? Uh, make sure you grab one of those and fill it up with uh, some spare change, cash, whatever you got. If you want to put a check in, you can do that. But uh, that goes to help support the Skylark ministry, and that is a great ministry. And we just ask that you bring those bottles back uh, by Father's Day. If you got any questions, feel free to see Miss Melanie, and she can uh, give you any information you need. Then, also, uh, next Sunday is going to be a big day. Uh, listen, we, there's a lot of stuff going on next Sunday. I'm just telling you now. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating our graduates. we got two of those that we're going to be celebrating. we got Camilla up here. Love's getting uh, called attention to, and we got Lou down here up front. Uh, and so uh, she loves uh, the attention, too. So um, listen, we're going to be uh, celebrating them next week, and so just looking forward to being able uh, to do that. And they're, they're excited to finally be done with Brunswick High School. I know that. Yeah, they're, they're looking forward to it. So. Anyway, uh, make sure you're here for that. Then as well, uh, also next Sunday, our ladies' Bible study will be picking back up. We've had a little bit of a two-week hiatus here, uh, and so uh, they'll be picking up next Sunday, uh, right in the middle of it. So encourage our ladies to, to plan for that as well. And then, uh, I know there was one more up there. Yep, we got Superhero Saturday. That is coming up. Listen, instead of our normal week-long vacation Bible school, we tried two Saturday events last year. That went fairly well. We're doing that again this year. Uh, and so our theme is called Superhero Saturday, and uh, we're excited about this. This is an opportunity to, we're going to talk about superheroes, and we're going to talk about not just superheroes, but superheroes in the Bible, and uh, make that connection. We're going to have a lot of fun, food, games. And so here's the thing. We need volunteers. Uh, if it's just uh, uh, Miss April and Miss Deanna who's helping her and myself and a couple others, it ain't going to go over very well. So we need volunteers. We got a sign up sheet out in the lobby. And um, so if you can help us on one or both of those days, make sure you sign up out there so that we can go ahead and uh, get that all planned up and get get everyone kind of sorted where we're going to put them. Uh, because that's going to be there's going to be great days. I just I'm looking forward to it. I think we're encouraging kids to dress up. Are we doing that? Yeah, yeah. Come on. Um, so we're going to try to encourage kids to dress up uh, as their favorite superheroes. It's going to be a fun a fun time. But they're also going to get the gospel while they're here. So that's important. All right. Um, I don't think I have any other slides up there. Is that correct? Yep. All right. Let me share a few other things. Don't forget, also next Sunday, we do have a baptismal service. Uh, so we will be having baptism next week. If you are interested in baptism, you need to be baptized, you haven't done that, feel free to come see me and let me know. Then as well, um, you see a couple other announcements in your bulletin. Uh, I know that the seniors have a, a, a little dolphin cruise that they're trying to get, figure out who might be interested in going. I think there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby for that. So encourage y'all to sign up for that. And then uh, this summer, our teens are planning to go to Wild Adventures. Uh, and so uh, that's going to be like an overnight trip. And Brother John needs to know, really he needs to know today who's planning on going, whether you're a teenager or whether you're one of the adults who might be going with the teenagers. Uh, he needs to know that today so that he can go ahead and purchase those tickets because they're going to go to a concert while they're there. And we want to make sure we get those concert tickets uh, as well. So um, that's going to be exciting. I'm going to that one. I'm just telling you. That's, I don't know if you like Christian music or not, but listen, For King and Country is going to be there, and I'm excited to go listen to For King and Country. That's some good music. So uh, make sure you see Brother John today. Either get with him after church or get with him today. Just do what you need to do. Let him know uh, if you are planning on going or, or any of that. So I know he would appreciate that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and let Miss Melanie come up and lead us in another song. All right, let's all stand. Let's sing Shout to the Lord.
Today is a special day. It is Mother's Day, and so uh, what I would love to do is just take a moment and say a, a prayer for our moms here in just a moment, but uh, can I do this? If you are a mom with us, would you stand for me? Get all our moms to stand just for a moment. All right, let, let's give these moms a hand, huh? All right, y'all can have a seat. And I'm, I want to say a, a prayer. And listen, as you leave today, we have a, a special gift for you. And so make sure you grab that on your way out. But if I can, let me lead us in a word of prayer. Just thanking God for the moms. Some of you, your moms are here. And some of us, uh, you, you may be here this morning and your mom has already gone to be with the Lord. And listen, we understand that. But aren't we grateful for the moms God has given us? And so let's, let's just say a special word of prayer. Heavenly Father. Uh, we come to you this morning so grateful and thankful for the gift of mom. And, and I pray that you would just bless all of the, these ladies here that, that stood and said, yes, they, they, they are mothers and they have, uh, I know many of them have tried to, to do what is right, tried to be uh, moms who have um, helped their children try to follow you. And God, we just pray that you would uh, bless them that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them, and Lord, that you would help them to know that they are loved and that we are so grateful for all you have used them for in our lives. Uh, just thank you for, for our moms. This morning, Lord, I, I do pray also as we get ready to come and to look into your word, I pray that you would lead us and guide us. I ask that you give me the strength as I get ready to bring this message. Father, would you speak through me? Would you prepare the hearts uh, that are uh, in that are here today for whatever message you might have for them. It's in Jesus name I pray. Amen. So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to turn to Joshua chapter five. If you would uh, like to have a Bible to follow along, there are some there in the seats in front of you. Uh, and so you can feel free to grab a hold of one of those and turn and look as well. So Joshua chapter five uh, will be in uh, this morning. And I want to begin this morning by sharing a story I heard about. Um, have you ever heard of, it was called the Franklin Expedition. I don't know, anyone ever heard of the Franklin Expedition? One, all right, all right. So we got one person, so if I tell it wrong, don't tell me, okay? Well, the Franklin Expedition was the largest expedition the Royal Navy had ever attempted to the Arctic at the time. Um, this was way back, you got to go way back in time to around 1845 is when this expedition took place. And the guy in charge, you'll be surprised to find out, his last name was Franklin. Hence they called it the Franklin Expedition. Uh, it, it was Captain John Franklin. And on this expedition, there were supposed to be about 120 guy, 20, 128 guys uh, going on this mission with Captain Franklin. And this mission was supposed to take them about two to three years for them to complete. Uh, well, they left, and after they left, nobody heard a word from them. They, it went about two years, and no one had heard anything. So needless to say, the Navy got concerned, and uh, they finally decided to send out a rescue operation. Well, as the story goes, they eventually discovered the debris of the original expedition. And there were, as you can imagine, no survivors. But what they discovered was absolutely astounding. When they went on this expedition, the captain and his men had not properly prepared for the mission that they were going on. First thing, uh, their first mistake, they didn't take enough food for the mission. Well, that seems like a pretty big problem, right? Uh, the second problem they had, they didn't take enough coal. So not enough food, not enough coal. But stunningly, what's interesting is not just what they failed to bring, it's what they did choose to bring. It, it turns out that uh, on this voyage, they made sure that they had room for a 1,200-volume library. They also made sure to bring all their silverware. So, interestingly, they had made sure they had enough, enough room for books, enough room for silverware, but not enough food. Here's the worst part, though. 
they didn't bring any special clothing for the Arctic weather. Now, uh, in fact, what they chose, they chose only to bring and only to wear their standard Navy uniforms. Now, I don't claim to be a big weather expert. I can, just like you, I can go on my phone and pull up the weather app. And I'm pretty sure, though, that I understand enough about weather to know that if you're going to go to the Arctic, you need something a little more substantial than just a regular Navy uniform. And these guys didn't take any any type of clothing that would help them. Now, looking back, it's easy for us to look at everything they chose to take and everything they failed to bring and say, man, those guys were crazy. How could they ever set off on this journey without making sure they had enough food, enough enough coal, enough warm clothes? Why wouldn't they make sure? How could they fail to prepare for the mission that was ahead of them? Well, listen, here's what I believe. I believe there are a lot of people in the world today. I believe there are a lot of Christians in the world today who are totally unprepared for the mission, the battle that is ahead of them. Listen, many of us, we're just not ready for what's coming next. I'm telling you, there is a spiritual battle that is being waged right now. And that battle is coming for you. It is coming for your children. It is coming for the church. And the question for us is this. Are we going to be prepared for the battle that's coming? A lot of Christians, we see the storm on the horizon. You know, it's interesting. We're getting close to to hurricane season. And and every time you'll see the, the track and they'll talk about some storm that might come hit here. And every time I just already know, you know, yeah, that storm's probably not really going to hit us straight on. It's just we're going to be fine. And, and that's kind of my mindset almost every time. And sometimes when it comes to the storms of life, we kind of we see the storm on the horizon, but we live under the belief that it's a storm that will skirt around us or that this particular storm will just blow over and it'll miss us completely. Well, listen, I'm telling you right now, whether you want to believe it or not, the spiritual battle is coming. And I want to encourage you to start getting prepared for it. I would actually say we're already under siege. The battle already began. Some of us just don't even realize it. And so we need to be prepared for the battle that's ahead, and that's why we're looking in the book of Joshua. The people of Israel have spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness, and they have finally crossed the Jordan River in miraculous fashion. To to say that it was a miracle is an understatement, but they have done it. They've reached the promised land. They finally arrived in that place where God said, listen, I have promised to give you every place the sole of your feet will touch. And so they've arrived and they've set up some memorial stones to remember the occasion as we talked about last week. But now... Now they're in a place where there is work to be done. Now it's time to get ready for battle. Crossing the Jordan was one thing. Setting up some memorial stones was one thing. But now we've got to get ready for battle. There are some battles ahead if we're going to take the land. And so they knew they had to get prepared. Joshua knew they had to get prepared. And Jericho was the first city in their sights. And man, were they going to need to be prepared for that. That's what we're going to see in Joshua chapter 5 as they get ready for this coming battle. And the way they prepared is what I believe we as well ought to be doing in order to prepare for the battles that we are going to face as well. So I'm going to show you three major things that they did this morning. Uh, Three major things they did to prepare for a battle. The first thing they did was they allowed God to mark their lives. They allowed God to mark their lives. If we're going to be properly prepared for the coming battles, it's really important for us to allow God to mark our lives. You got Joshua chapter 5 open. Look at verse 1 with me. Just verse 1 for now. So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan. Remember, the, the, the children of Israel started on the east side. They have crossed the Jordan, and now they're on the west side. So when the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea 
heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over. Notice what it says next here. When they saw this and heard about it, their heart melted. And there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Now listen, there are a couple of ways that the Israelites allowed God to mark their lives. And the first one we see right here in verse 1. First of all, they allowed God to mark their lives with His presence. They allowed God to mark their lives with His presence. God had marked their lives by being with them. And you can see this in verse 1. The kings of the land were terrified of the Israelites. It says that their hearts melted with the spirit of fear and the spirit of defeat when the Israelites came across the Jordan. Well, why? Why were they so full of fear after this? Well, it goes back to what we read a couple of weeks ago in Joshua chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Remember there we read that as soon as the priests who were carrying the ark. Remember, the ark of the covenant was that that manifestation. It was that box that represented God's presence among his people. And so here are the priests. They're carrying the ark that represents God's presence. And and, and Joshua 3 tells us that as soon as they uh, stepped and reached into the Jordan, their feet touched the water, that the water stopped flowing from, from upstream And it stood in a heap. Simply put, it was like an invisible dam had been put in place. And because of that, the Israelites were able to march across this mile-wide river and enter into the promised land. They should have never been able to cross it, but their God had been with them. And it was obvious to everyone who saw it that it was their God who was there with them doing this. Well, who heard about this? Who heard about this, this feat that took place? It was the people living just across the river. You can be sure that they had seen all of the Israelites camped on the east side of the river. You can be sure they had some spies watching the, the Israelites to see what they were going to do. Were they going to stay put? Were they going to march a, to a different spot and try to enter the land a different way? And can you imagine the eyes of those spies. Can you, can you just picture these spies watching all of this take place? They're sitting there. They're, they're probably just eating something, eating a few grapes or something. I don't know. And, and they're watching these priests as they foolishly carry this big heavy box and go walking towards the river. And they're thinking, those idiots. What are they going to They're going to get swept away by the river current, by the flood. And as soon as uh, they step into the river, can you imagine their eyes when they suddenly watch the water stop and they see it start piling up way off in the distance? And now they watch the Israelites start walking across. You talk about a moment of fear. Listen, I promise you, it didn't take long for word to spread throughout the land and it struck fear into the hearts of everyone who heard it. Well, why did this act? Why did the Israelites crossing the Jordan strike such fear? Well, it's for the same reason you would be afraid. That's not something that happens every day. Anyone ever gone to the Otamaha River and watched it just get plugged up and pile up in a a big heap on one side? No, No. Okay, so we've never really seen that. If that happened, I'd be full of a little fear, like what in the world is happening here? That is what we call a miracle. And so the kings see this. And any hope they had of defeating these people, it just vanished. Because it was obvious to everyone on the west side of the Jordan, it was obvious that the Israelites' God was with them. It was obvious that their God could do things that their gods simply could not do and had never done before. So they were scared out of their mind. Now think about it from the Israelites' perspective. Can you imagine being the Israelites as they cross the Jordan? Uh, I can't help but think that suddenly as they're crossing the Jordan that, that they had this sudden confidence about them, knowing that God was with them, right? 
There had to be a feeling of invincibility as they're crossing the Jordan. They see way upstream the pile of water, and they're walking across where they shouldn't be walking. And you got to believe that as they're walking across, they say, man, if our God can do this, the enemy doesn't stand a chance. For them, this was a Romans 8.31 moment come to life. What does Romans 8.31 say? It says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Listen, God marked His presence in their lives by actually being present with them. Did you know, Christian, did you know God marks your life the same way? If you're a follower of Jesus, did you know God is present with you right now? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God, what? Dwells in you. Where does the Spirit of God live? He lives within you, Christian. Listen, Jesus promised us in Matthew 28 that He would never leave us nor forsake us. He then promised us that He would send a comforter. He would send the Holy Spirit to take His place here with us. And that is exactly what has happened for the Christian. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. You have the presence of God with you in whatever battle you're facing. And man, there is power in knowing that God is present with us when we realize we're going into battle. And so we need, we need to understand that as we go into battle, we do so with God's presence marking our lives. When you hear that God is with you, that ought to instill a, a sense of confidence that he's, that he's with you. Because it doesn't matter how dark the path you're traveling on is. I've got God's presence with me. It doesn't matter what obstacles you're facing. God's presence is with you. Just knowing that God is present ought to bring you hope as you enter into the battles ahead. So God marked their lives with His presence. But secondly, God marked their lives outwardly and inwardly. And we need to allow God to mark our lives outwardly and inwardly. Look at verses 2 through 9 of Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, beginning verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised. But all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. But the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he should give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 7, Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was, when they had finished circumcising all the people, that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. So here in these verses, we read a whole lot about these men being circumcised. Now this, understand, was a command uh, for God's people that began all the way back Uh, In Genesis chapter 17, verse 11, with Abraham. God said to Abraham in Genesis, he said, And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And listen, understand, here's the reason why. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
So listen, this physical act of circumcision was a sign that physically marked the people of God. And it marked them to show that they were in a covenant relationship with God. It showed that they belonged to God. Well, there's one problem. As we just read in Joshua chapter 5, and we see uh, the generation that came out of Egypt, that whole generation, they had been circumcised. They had identified with God. They did that before they left Egypt. However, for 40 years, as they wandered around the desert and in the wilderness because of their disobedience, For those 40 years, they had failed to follow God's instructions. They had failed to mark their children as being followers of God. And so before they can enter into battle, before they can enter in and get the victory that God has for them, they needed to take a moment and rededicate themselves and re-identify themselves with the God they served. So understand that this whole act of circumcision, this wasn't some kind of punishment. This was a way to identify and show that they were different from everyone else around them because God had marked them in their flesh. It was a way of showing that they were cutting off sin, a way of showing that they were dedicating themselves to live lives holy and dedicated to God. Well, listen, the same thing is true for us today. The distinguishing mark of the believer is not that we cut ourselves in some way. No, no, no. That's not what the distinguishing mark is. But the distinguishing mark of the believer is that we are called to cut out all the things in our lives that are based on our fleshly desires. Listen, it's to get the world to cut sin and the world out of our lives. And to dedicate ourselves to live lives that are holy and dedicated to God. That is what we're supposed to be. We're to be committed to be different from the way the rest of the world lives. Because, you see, when you meet Jesus, something changes. When you really meet Jesus and you really get a relationship with him... Your life is never the same afterwards. Jesus changes things. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So listen, if you're here this morning, if you have become a follower of God, God is going to mark you with his presence. But he's going to mark you to live differently in the world. There will be an outward change that evidences the inward change of your heart. That's what the circumcision was. It it was this outward show of what God had done in the heart. For the Christian, we're called to live differently in this world. Not to follow a bunch of rules. It's got nothing to do with that. Listen, many of you know me. I could care less about legalism. I could care less about giving me a list of rules. I'm not concerned about a list of rules. But when Jesus truly changes your life, it changes you on the inside. And that produces change on the outside. That's what God is looking for. Uh, let, Let me, many of us, here's what happens though. We say we follow God. But we try to keep carrying around our old life with us. We say, I want to follow God, but I'm going to bring all this stuff with me. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Um, I am not a camper. Okay? Uh, I I don't enjoy camping. I was was interested hearing Josh. He had talked about going camping a few weeks ago. And uh, I believe, Josh, you were out there there, uh, toughing it out. You had the tents and the sleeping bags and, and all that stuff. Yeah, that's not camping for me. I mean, that's camping, but I can't do that. If I'm going to go camping, guess what I need? I need one of the motorhomes or one of them big RV. You know, I, I, need, I need electricity. I need indoor plumbing. I need a shower. I need a bed. Uh, I need air conditioning and heat. 
I need all those things. Now listen, some of you who are campers, let's be that's not really camping, is it? <laughs> what? <laughs> glamping, yeah. Yeah, glamping. That's not really camping. Here's what you're doing. You're changing your location, but you're bringing all the comforts of home still with you, aren't you? For me, that's the only kind of camping I would really be interested in. You tell me we're going to go out in the woods, sleep in a sleeping bag on a, in, a, in a tent? I'm like, bless you, have fun. <laughs> okay? But isn't that what we do in our Christian lives? We say, I want to follow God. And God says, oh, great, come over here. And we say, great, God, can I bring all this stuff with me? Can I bring all the stuff from before that makes me comfortable and happy? Can I bring that with me? And God says, listen, I've got so much more for you. Forget about that stuff. I need you to focus on where I'm taking you and what I've got. Listen, when you choose to follow Je Jesus, you're different. You're transformed. The Hebrews were marked by God's presence. And they allowed God to mark them outwardly as an evidence that they were different from the world around them. GIBC, listen, we have the presence of God with us. And as we go into battles, we are facing a spiritual war. And we need to allow God to mark our lives with his presence, yes, but we need to allow God to mark our lives outwardly and inwardly. Allow him to mark our lives outwardly in the way we live so that it represents the change that God has done in our hearts. So, we want to prepare for the battle? Allow God to mark your life. Secondly, if you want to prepare for the battle, properly prepare, then you need to celebrate God's provision. You need to celebrate God's provision. Look with me at verse 10. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. Now listen, as we talk about celebrating God's provision, listen, there is a lot to encourage us, a lot to help get us excited for what God can do in the battle coming before us. And the first thing we see here in verse 10 is they celebrate the Passover. Well, let, let me give you this. If we're going to celebrate God's provision, the first way we do that is by remembering his past provision. If I'm going to celebrate God's provision, I have to remember his past provision. After the Israelites finally crossed the Jordan River, we read they circumcised all the men. Well, why did they need to do that? We talked about part of the reason, but there's another reason why they did it. Because in order to participate in the Passover celebration, it was required that the men be circumcised. Well, what was Passover? What was so important about Passover? Listen, Passover is a commemoration. It was a celebration of what God had done for his people in the land of Egypt. It was a celebration of when God delivered them from the land of Egypt and, and all the plagues that God sent on the land of Egypt. And so as they're getting ready to move forward into battle, they first, they needed to remember what God had already done. They needed to take the time to remember how God had provided them for them in the past, and that was what they did as they celebrated Passover. They're getting ready to go into battle, and they needed some encouragement. Well, what better way to be encouraged than to remember all the times God has provided in the past? For the Israelites, God and God had come in and he had freed them from slavery in Egypt. If God could free us from the hand of Egypt, if he could free us from that slavery, then surely God can handle what's coming next. There was a celebration in remembering his past provision. For us, God has given us freedom from slavery to sin. 
We no longer, because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, we do not have to be slaves to sin anymore. And if God worked in our lives in the past, if God saved the soul of this sinner, then God can do anything else I need done in this life. If God can save me and the wretch that I am, then God can handle any battle coming. He can work in the future just as well as He's worked in my past. The Israelites, they could be encouraged by looking back and reflecting on how God had so powerfully moved in their past, and we can do the same. As we face the battles, take a moment and celebrate everything God has done for you in the past. If He could do it then, He can do it now. I'm reminded of 2008, y'all know, and I've talked about this, you remember 2008? We had the economy really crashed, right? And I remember I was working, and I had just been promoted. I was assistant manager out at Sea Island Transportation. Things were going great. It was wonderful. I bought myself a brand-new truck because the economy was so great. First brand-new vehicle I'd ever bought. We'll never do that again. (laughs) Bought this brand-new truck. I was so happy. Come back from a missions trip, and next thing I know, the economy tanks, and, and we're... I mean, we're in trouble financially because Sea Island came to us and said, hey, we're firing a whole bunch of people. They came to our department and said, all right, you're a management. Start picking who's going to get fired. That's always fun, right? And then they come to us and say, all right, now that you've done all that, here's what we're going to do. You can either be fired yourself or we're going to cut your hours. We're going to demote you so that we can pay you less, and then we're going to cut your hours by over half so that now you're making a third of what you made before but don't worry you're still going to keep working and doing everything you have all the same responsibilities you had before you talk about a moment of fear i'm telling you there were days where i was at home like god i don't know how we're going to survive this i mean this was a financial hit but man i can look at it i can look back and say god took care of us every step of the way i didn't miss a a meal I didn't miss a meal. We didn't, we didn't starve in our house. We still got paid because God provided and He kept taking care of us. Listen, that's one of the things God did in my past that I can look on and say, man, if God could handle that, He can handle my next battle. I can celebrate what He did in the past. But I want you to notice something very important happens in these next two verses, verses 11 and 12. It says, and they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us, we have no problem celebrating God's provision and what He's done in the past. That's the easy part. Man, I can look back, I can celebrate all day long everything God did in the past. Here's the tough part. Celebrating God's provision by accepting changes to God's provision. Can we continue to celebrate God's provision when He changes the provision? We're told the next day after Passover that they ate food from the produce of the land. Well, in our minds, we immediately think, well, of course they did. They got to eat, right? Of course they ate from the produce of the land. They got to feed themselves. Well, don't forget, for the last 40 years, the Israelites have not been feeding themselves. God had been feeding them with manna and quail every single day. Think about it. They're wandering around in the wilderness. Let's just say they happen to come across a couple of goats in the wilderness. Is that going to be enough to feed 100,000 people or however many Israelites there were? No, that's not enough to feed the people every day. So God had to feed his people while they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. We're told in Exodus chapter 16, verse 13, it says, So it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance. 
as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. So think about this. For 40 years, bread has basically fallen from the skies as God fed his people. Every morning, they just get up and there's magical bread on the ground. How many of you wish your food would show up that way, right? Just, it, it just magically appears in your house. For 40 years, God has fed his people that way. But in verse 12 of Joshua 5, notice what it says happened. The manna ceased. So does that mean God is saying to his people, all right, I'm done with you. I'm done providing. I've given you manna for 40 years and I'm done. You're, you're on your own, folks. Figure it out. Is that what God is doing here? Well, no, it's not that at all. In fact, God is, this is God's way of saying, look at what I've done. I provided for you one way for 40 years. And that's been good. That's worked. But look around you now. I've brought you into the land that I promised I would give you. And that land, that land you're in now, that's going to produce for you. It's a promise I gave you. And today it is the evidence of a promise I've kept. It's God's way of saying, listen, I'm still providing. I've just changed how I'm going to provide. Can you imagine the panic when they got up that next morning and they didn't find manna on the ground? Do you think there were some folks in the camp who were like, wait, whoa, whoa, what do we do now? We got to go pick grapes off of that thing? What? We got, we got to go pick the fruit? I imagine there was some panic. Some people probably wondering, wait, did God forget us? And then suddenly, God says, look around. There's enough food for everyone. And that panic turns to celebration. It turns to celebration. Just think about it. No more manna. You want to tell me they weren't celebrating this moment, the moment God changed his method of provision? Can you imagine eating the same meal every single day for 40 years? I don't know about you. I hate eating the same meal once a week. When, 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 listen, there are some dishes I love when Karen cooks. They're good. I'm not, I'm not picking on her cooking, I promise you. But there are some meals when I hear she's cooking, I'm like, wait, didn't we have that last week? Do we really have to get... You know what? How about we just go up to McDonald's? Because I don't I know. <laughs> Anyone else like that? Come on. How many of you can't stand the leftovers? How many of you? If you're like me, the left, you save the leftovers and then they just sit in the fridge. Because every time you open the fridge, you're like, ugh. <laughs> I don't think I can handle that. 40 years they've eaten the same thing every day. You're going to tell me they weren't celebrating when God finally said, hey guys, guess what? I got a new way for you to eat now. Go pick you some fruit. Go, go get you from the produce of the land. Listen, they were celebrating this new provision. But in our lives, some of us, some of us don't really like change, do we? Change scares us. I guarantee you it scared some of the Israelites when God's provision changed. Listen, Christian, God has provided for you in the past and he will continue to provide for you in the future. It may not always look the same, but we should always be celebrating God's provision. That is the second way we prepare for the upcoming battle. Psalm 23, verse 6 says this. I love this. I want you to follow with me just a minute. And I know I'm, I'm starting to run short on time, but Psalm 23, 6 says this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Man, what a promise of God. You want to talk about God's provision, God's goodness? The psalmist said, God's goodness and mercy are going to follow me all the days of my life. But I don't want you to get the wrong picture here. When it talks about 
goodness and mercy, God's goodness and mercy following me, it's not talking about like the little puppy dog trying to follow you and just, you know, nipping at your heels. It's not talking about that type of follow. In Psalm 26, the word follow is the same word used when Pharaoh followed the Israelites all the way to the Red Sea. Listen, Pharaoh wasn't following after the Israelites like a little lost puppy. He was following them with full zeal, with every intention of overcoming them and bringing them back. The word follow in Psalm is the same word used of King Saul when he was following David in the wilderness. Listen, that word was used to to show that King Saul was hunting for David. So the idea here in this psalm is that God's mercy and God's goodness are following after you. God's goodness and His mercy are hunting you down. Think about it. God is coming after you. He's chasing after you. He is pursuing after you. Why? Is He pursuing you and hunting you down so He can harm you? No, Christian, the reason He's pursuing you is to bless you with goodness and mercy. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, hunt after me, seek after me all the days of my life. Tell me you don't have something to celebrate when God says, listen, I'm coming after you as hard as I can with my goodness and my mercy. Let me give you the third way to prepare for the coming battles. We need to allow God to mark our lives. We need to celebrate God's provision. And thirdly and lastly, we need to look to God alone for victory. Look to God alone for victory. Look with me at these last three verses, verses 13 through 15. It says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. At some point, Joshua, he gets off over to the side, and I imagine he's standing there, probably looking off at Jericho in the distance, and he's thinking about the coming battle. Joshua, in his own right, is a great military commander. In fact, there are, there are historians who study some of the battles of Joshua and some of the tactics that were employed. He is a great military commander, but even he is unsure of how in the world to a, he's going to attack this heavily fortified city. Remember, it's got double walls protecting it. it it's not going to be an easy victory. And suddenly, as he's pondering all of this, he looks up, And here, standing in front of him, seemingly out of nowhere, is a man standing there with a sword in his hand. And Joshua asks the same question that I'm pretty sure each and every one would ask. If someone appears suddenly in front of me, holding a weapon, my first question is, are you here to hurt me or help me? Right? Are you here for me, ultimately? And I love the the answer the man really doesn't give him an answer to the question. He's basically neither. No, that, I'm not, that's not the question I'm answering. He says, instead, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Now, I'm going to tell you this. A lot of folks have analyzed this phrase. They've tried to figure out exactly who this man was. And I think it's easy to determine, though, in my opinion, when you look at Joshua's response. Because what does it say his response is to this man? He bows down and worships him. Listen, in Scripture, there is only one person who is ever deemed worthy of worship. And who is that? That is God, Jesus Christ. God Almighty is the only one worthy of worship. We see plenty of examples in Scripture when uh, when, when people would bow down and worship those who were not God. They would worship the apostles. They would try to bow down and worship angels. And every time we're told of those instances, those people 
always tell them to stop. Don't do that. Because worship is for God alone. You notice there's no rebuke here, is there? He never rebukes and says, don't worship me. That's our sign that this is God. I believe this is Jesus in pre-incarnate form. And He is there. And, and in fact, we, we, I believe it's also God because you see that He tells them, listen, take off your sandals. This is holy ground. Just as Moses had at the burning bush. So I believe this person is Jesus in pre-incarnate form. And it's interesting. What is Jesus holding? He's holding a sword. That sword is a sign for Joshua. Here is God letting Joshua know, listen, Joshua, you don't, you don't have to fight this battle. I'm going to fight it for you. I am the commander of God's army. It's God who will be fighting this battle. What more encouragement can a person need than that? There's this song out, and I know a lot of churches sing it, and, um, I, but there's this song that's out now that, that talks about, I'm fighting a battle that he's already won. How many of us are fighting battles that God says, listen, will you just get out of the way and let me? I, I've got the battle. I'm the one that's won it. We see a, an amazing story in 2 Chronicles about a king of Judah. His name is Jehoshaphat. Man, Jehoshaphat, I, I love this account, this story. In this stormy story, there was a, an army that was invading the land of Judah. And this king was invading. And Jehoshaphat, he didn't have the forces. He didn't have the, the army to uh, withstand this king who was invading. And so, listen, Jehoshaphat, he was scared to death. And 2 Chronicles tells us in chapter 20, verse 3, it says, And Jehoshaphat feared. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. Man, being afraid will do that to you, won't it? When you get afraid, that'll set you to seeking God and seeking His face. It says Joshua, Joshua feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Listen, he didn't know what else to do, so he did the only thing he could. He turned to God. He was scared to death. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. He's praying to God. He says, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude. Some of you are looking at the battles that are coming, the enemies that are against you. You're saying, I've got no power against this battle. I've got no power in this. I've got no way to defeat this enemy. That's Jehoshaphat. He says, we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. So we're going to do the only thing we know to do. And he says, but our eyes are upon you. Let me tell you something. That's a good place to be. When you're in a place where all you can do is look to God, you finally come to the point where you realize, I cannot do this. I don't have the power. There's no way for me to get the victory. And my only choice is to look to God. That is a great place to be. Because then we see how God responded. In 2 Chronicles 20, 15, God responds and says, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Listen, church, there is a battle ahead of us. I'm telling you, it's light versus darkness. It's good versus evil. And you know, sometimes... As a pastor, sometimes I feel like Jehoshaphat. I look around and I say, Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, I don't know. I don't know what to do except to look at you. It's so easy for us to feel helpless like Jehoshaphat. And we feel like we don't know what to do. We, we feel like, Lord, we're powerless. I mean, God, we're just one small little church. We're just a few people standing in the midst of a dark world where it seems like the whole world is rushing off the side of a cliff. We're in a world where just about everything you watch on television is absolutely godless and spits in the face of God himself. And we say, what can we do? 
Well, listen, if you feel that way, then be encouraged by the story of the man who stood before Joshua. Because he was reminding Joshua, the battle's not yours. I'm going to fight this battle. You just do whatever I tell you and let me fight and win the battle. This man was reminding Joshua, Jesus was reminding Joshua that God stands with his people and will continue to stand with his people. The battle we're in now, the battles we're going to face, they're not ours. They're the Lord's. Let me ask you this morning, are you prepared for the battles that are ahead of you? Let me tell you this, if you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're not prepared for the battles. You see, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to be following the Lord. You've got to be, you've got to allow God to mark your life. L- let me ask you, have you allowed God to truly mark your life? Have you come to that point where you say, God, I- I've been trying to do this all on my own and I can't do it. I've been trying to live right, I've been trying to do right, and I just can't, I can't make it happen, God. Listen, He came and He died on a cross for your sins. You've been trying to get victory over sin, you can't get it on your own. He says, listen, I came, I died on the cross for your sins so that you don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. You can put your faith and trust in him today and you can experience a freedom you've never had before. But listen, if you're here this morning, you're a Christian, I'm telling you, we're in a spiritual battle. We as a church, we as God's people, we're going to continue to face battles. Are we prepared for what's ahead? Have we allowed God to mark our lives? Have we been celebrating God's provision, not just his provision of the past, but are we celebrating when he changes how he provides? And are we looking to God? Are we looking to God alone for victory? That's what we need to be as God's people. I'm going to ask you uh, uh, to stand. I'm going to ask the instrumentalists to come forward. We're going to have a moment of response, a time of invitation. If God is speaking to your heart, listen, these altars are going to be open. You're welcome to come and to pray. You can come and talk to God. It may be something about this message. It could be something totally different. If God is speaking to your heart about something, listen, these are open. If you say, I can't get down, my knees won't let me get down, there are seats up here on the front. You can come sit. You can pray in your seat. You can pray right where you're at if you need to pray right where you're at. But if God is speaking to your heart, will you respond? Listen, God, he's looking for us to be prepared for the battles ahead. Are you prepared? Are you here this morning? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Is he on your side? That's the question. Is he on your side? As they play, if God is speaking to you, would you respond? Thank you so much for being with us. Man, what powerful words to that song. I need thee every hour. Listen, we want to prepare for the victory. We want to get the victory. We're going to need God. We need him every hour for when those battles come. All right. Listen, thank you so much uh, again for being here. And uh, if you were visiting with us, if you were guests with us, you're here with family, you're here with mom today. Thanks for coming and being with us. I pray that you've been blessed. We do want to be a blessing to our moms. We have a small gift for you as you head out the doors. So uh, make sure you grab, uh, grab that on your way out. Thank you so much. If I can be a blessing to you, be a help to you in any way, 
let me know. Now, I did want to mention this um, real quickly. We have our, our, our men, we have a little disc golfing group we've started. I think, we, what are we calling it? The Golden Disciples. Yeah, the Golden Disciples. Uh, listen, our plan has kind of been, I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to meet every Sunday at 5 o'clock out at the, the field. Now, I'm going to tell you today, today's Mother's Day. We're probably not meeting either, but uh, I think what we're going to do is, uh, if you ever want to join us out there, feel free to do that. Uh, Golden Disciples. We're going to do some disc golfing every Sunday at 5 o'clock. Um, and it's kind of, you don't have to be out there, but it's going to be, if you're a, if our men or whoever is able to be out there, if you're able to be that day, great. If not, whoever shows up, that's who's going to disc golf that day, all right? So I uh, just wanted to share that word for our golden disc golf. So we even have a logo for it now. Yeah, we, we created a logo for it. What, did we have that on the screen today? No? We, we, yeah, we need to get that on the screen here very soon in the sliding announcements at the beginning. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. You'll love it. It's golden. <laughs> And it looks like a disc. Um, so anyway, I um, wanted to share that because some of you have been involved in that. So, all right, I need to stop talking. Please come dismiss us in a song. All right, let's close out with Let There Be Praise. Praise.